Hi, everyone. Uh, we are here for the first uh, webinar of the European Union Law and Sustainable Development webinar series. Uh, I have online the academic coordinator of the uh, Jamonet module in European Union Law and Sustainable Development. Hi, everyone. Uh, we are here for the first Professor uh, uh, Ricardo Pavoni and uh, the executive director of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network, Guido Mitrov. Um, I give the floor to Professor Pavoni to just introduce the webinar and to introduce our uh, guest. Uh, but first of all, I would like to remind you that uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, YouTube Live, you can, and you can ask questions to Guido and to Professor Pavoni, and I will collect the questions. I will um, give them to the uh, speakers uh, after the first part of this conversation, which is expected to last uh, around 30 minutes. Um, Professor Pavoni, do you want to uh, start? Yes, why not? Uh, just a few words, actually, in order to uh, complete. It's expected to last uh, around 30 minutes. Um, Professor Pavoni, do you want Okay, uh, no, the, the, I would just like to say a couple of words about uh, our uh, module, which is co-funded by the European Commission and is about European Union law and sustainable development. Of course, as I, I am an international lawyer, so my focus is mostly on legal issues, but as everybody knows, sustainable development is by definition multidisciplinary so our uh, aim when we are organizing this webinar series is, is to invite leading experts uh, on uh, sustainability science and sustainable development in general also from uh, a variety of disciplines such as economics science etc etc uh, we want to have this multidisciplinary approach as much as possible um, of course, the fact that this module is co-funded by the European Commission uh, does not mean that we have to spare criticism to the European approach uh, to the fulfillment or implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. Um, just a couple of words uh, to introduce our guest speaker. Um, Dr. Guido Schmidt-Traub, as everybody knows, is the Executive Director of the UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network. This kind of informal organization, which operates under, under the auspices of the UN's Secretary General, um, Guido Schmidt is one of the uh, leading experts, world's leading experts on the Sustainable Development Goals. Of course, he has followed the process leading to the adoption of these goals uh, very closely. He was previously involved in the formulation and on the process leading to the adoption of the former Millennium Development Goals. Um, Guido Schmidt holds uh, a couple of PhDs, as far as I understand, one from Oxford University uh, in economics and another one from Wageningen University in economics. Uh, he is um, an expert on financial issues, uh, is an expert on uh, <clears throat> on uh, land use, sustainable land use and food systems and on sustainability at large. Uh, I would just like to say that we are enormously grateful to Guido for uh, accepting our invitation to be the first speaker for our webinar series. Uh, and uh, I immediately uh, give the floor to Guido and I'm looking forward to his uh, talk. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thanks so much for inviting me. Can you can you hear me? There was a small problem with the connection. I don't know if it was at my end. Yes. No, no, no. We can hear you well. Very good. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for inviting me to this webinar. It's really exciting. And uh, first of all, congratulations. And thanks to you for organizing this. It's always good to, um, to engage on the same development goals and also particularly keen to also engage on them from a legal perspective community perspective, something that we don't do a lot because they, of course, raise lots of different questions. I think in opening, I'd just like to be very brief because I really want this to be a discussion. I mean, the, the, the few points I'd like to make is that first, these, these goals are an opportunity. 
Um, they are a bit of an unusual construct for, for, for lawyers um, because they are a different tool for international cooperation. They're different from the conventions. Uh, and other tools of um, of international cooperation that um, that are framed by by lawyers and are framed in terms of legally binding um, uh, commitments by either member states or other actors. And so, um, the first question one might, one might ask is, well, what's what's the value in such goals? Does this does this um, what does this add? And we have, of course, an earlier process that we've gone through, which were the Millennium Development Goals, which were launched around 2001. They were legally non-binding. They weren't even adopted by governments at the time. They were just um, presented by the UN Secretary General. And at the time, and I was involved in this in 2002, most people said, well, they, said they, they really they, they were criticized on two grounds. One is they're not legally binding, so why should why would governments do anything? And second, people then pointed out the gaps. There were, it was a short list of eight goals. People in particular pointed to the lack of a goal on governance, on human rights. And my response at the time was was twofold. One is... Um, of course, we need good governance and we need human rights to achieve an end of extreme poverty. So in that sense, these issues were always part and parcel of the Millennium, Devo of the Millennium Development Goals agenda. The MDGs also didn't refer to roads, for example, but it is impossible to achieve any of the other goals without having adequate road networks. So that was the first point. The second point is I said, well, let, let's see you know, whether these goals will be taken up. And what happened is the goals really inspired a generation of, of activists and leaders and have become a big success, particularly in the health sector. Such a success that, in, that when, the, when the sustainable development goals were negotiated after uh, the Rio plus 20 process, every government wanted to be part of it. Every government wanted um, to have a word, a say in, in framing them, even though they were legally non-binding tools. So for me, the lesson, I think this is quite an interesting one, is that these non-binding tools, particularly in today's age, where we have a lot more social media, a lot of um, more direct and, and low-cost forms of, um, of mobilization, are an important um, tool, can be. They complement, they do not replace the legally binding conventions like the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. Then, but so that's that I think is the opportunity that we have. But the goals are right now they're just um, they're just a few words written on paper. What is really encouraging is to see governments around the world take them on. Um, I have been a bit disappointed by the take up of the goals in Europe. Uh, we can come to that because they've all too often been framed as an agenda for developing countries. So European governments have have delegated them often to the development ministry saying, how can we help Africa achieve the sustainable development goals? Whereas, of course, there are major challenges, as, as our work shows, in every European country and at the union at large. Um, but putting even that aside, overall, I've been very, very impressed by the take up of government by governments of these goals. Um, you can't really travel to any country these days without this conversation coming up. Um, and just most recently, we, we, we were in the Arab Emirates, Indonesia, Brazil, uh, Vietnam, China. Um, these are just some examples of discussions um, of places where these are very similar. And I think the challenge for all of us now, particularly also for the legal community, is to help fill in the knowledge gap that we have. This is also a peculiar or a particular important part of the, of the same development goals. They map up transformation, some of which are very, very complex and for which we don't really have ready answers. So it's not just a question of political will just to get, get, the, get the recommendations implemented because we don't really know for sure how to decarbonize an energy system to meet the Paris Climate Agreement goal. We don't really know how to decrease inequality in an age of, um, of, mobile, of globalization and rapid technological change. Um, we don't really know how to make cities sustainable. Um, and we don't really know what the future of work will be. These are, these are just some questions. And then of course, um, we don't know what modern technologies can do to make um, education uh, more effective and lower the costs. We don't know what the future of healthcare will be. So there are, there are many really big questions that we need to get a better understanding of. And I would say that by and large, we do not apply enough knowledge to them. And so the goals are right now, they're an opportunity to have a different conversation, not a, not a conversation about what should we aim for, what should we, what should, what should be our goal, but really to say, and this is what I urge all of us to do, is to say, these are the goals, let's have a conversation about how to achieve them. 
how can we how can we end extreme poverty how can we decarbonize energy systems how can we make our our cities productive sustainable and consistent with the um for example the paris climate agreement how can we protect the biodiversity that life depends on um and of course how can we reduce inequalities and that is i think a really empowering a very a very interesting set of questions i think it also uh, and that, let, let me make this my closing point for this introductory remark. I think it also poses very interesting and novel challenges for academia and academic research. Because academia is, of course, organized by disciplines, and there are good reasons for that. Um, academia is also very often organized around papers, which you can publish in peer-reviewed journals, uh, so that you can get tenure and move to the next uh, step on the, on, the, on the ladder of academic achievement. But it is not typically um, organized around solving complex problems. I think the one set of disciplines I would, I, would, I would take out from this is the engineering field, which basically is set up to design complex machines, for example, to accomplish very specific tasks. So they, they, it's a, it's, in that sense, it's a problem-solving discipline. Science and social and natural sciences really focus much more on the, on the unguided, undirected, uh, expansion of knowledge and that is very useful i'm not arguing against blue sky research but we also need communities of experts to work on solving these very complex challenges and they require legal expertise they require engineering expertise they require scientific expertise they require expertise in pedagogy in um, in stakeholder engagements and governance issues political science and so forth i mean i you know, there's really no discipline under the sun that I would I would excuse from having from from not having to work on the same development goals. The big question is how do we organize ourselves to do this? Um, and that I think is one of the most exciting and one of the most defining questions for universities in the 21st century. Um, and this is something that we at the SCSN try to promote, try to support, and we try to empower universities to become partners for governments and society at large in diagnosing these challenges and mapping out pathways and ways to achieve these goals by bringing together um, the different fields of endeavor. And we do this um, by organizing national and regional networks. We organized uh, launch a network in Switzerland, um, where Dario also was. Um, we have um, networks in Italy, in Germany, in Spain and Greece, we're launching France soon, all the countries. So many of the European countries are already there, but also other parts of the world. Second is, and this is to, to foster these discussions. What, what can universities do? How can we solve these problems? Second, we promote very specific solutions initiatives. How can we use technology? What can we do from a legal perspective and so forth? And we then also um, uh, promote online education as a tool to bring together different, different disciplines and as a way to bring top content also from practitioners into the classrooms. These are very exciting challenges. We are, we're a small organization, a large network, but a small organization, and hope to be able to, um, to make a contribution to this and hope that you will all join us, as you already have, in, in this, um, in this, um, in this um, generational project to achieve the same development goals. Thank you. Thank you, Guido. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think it's... Uh, it's, um, it's, a, it's a very nice way to start the conversation. I um, want to make a very general uh, sort of point as we, as we start before we jump into more um, specific questions. Um, you were um, mentioning the, the role of uh, the legal community as an, a very important epistemic community. And yep. of course, if we look at the European context, uh, you know, uh, it, it is one of those cases where you have a, an incredibly lively uh, legal community, uh, a lot of legal uh, complex challenges that we have started to, to think about ever since, of course, the start of the European experiment. Um, so the, 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 main, the main general question here is, how do you see actually the, the uptake of the SDGs in a European context. I know that uh, after the publication of the SDG index uh, and of the second edition, you were involved in, uh, in, in a few events through SDSN at the European Commission, sort of discuss uh, what's the current, what, what are the current trends, what is the state of the implementation. So if you could introduce a sort of uh, both maybe a data, but also your perspective of how is how is the, the how is the topic of the SDGs being increasingly incorporated in the European context? 
Um, well, these are these are these are great questions. Um, first, I think we as Europeans, I think many of us on this call are Europeans. We should be extremely proud um, to see the SDGs having come to life because it's basically the world signing on to the European model of development. It's a social market economy with environmental sustainability. That's not the US model, it's not the Chinese model, um, and it's no other country's model, and Europe really stands for that. We have our own challenges in Europe, we, don't, we know that for sure, and we need to balance things, but that is a big achievement. And so I was dis I've been disappointed for a while that the European Commission in particular has not been taking this on centrally. And I'm, of course, in full recognition that there are a few other issues that Europe is dealing with right now. Brexit, um, the Trump administration, what's happening in Poland, Hungary, um, and so forth. So these are, these are difficult times. I'm, I, I'm totally cognizant of that. But I, I do think and I, what, what's encouraging now is to see is that First Vice President Timmermans is speaking far more and, and, and very boldly about the sustainable development goals. So I think things are moving in the right direction. In terms of the legal community, let me just uh, say one thing also to, pro to provoke a little bit. I think um, just like every community, we need to, we need to know the limits of, of what we can and cannot do. And in the climate negotiations, my view is that we have the Paris Climate Agreement. And yes, certainly there's a lot more that needs to be negotiated. There are a few more details to be ironed out. But when you look at the delegations that countries sent to, to the COP, they're overwhelmingly lawyers. And I don't think that's right. Because with all due respect, it's not the lawyers that are going to tell us how to decarbonize an energy system. Um, so I think we need to bring in, and, and, and there is, there is the legal profession is very influential. The lawyers and economists somehow run the world, and and it's maybe not, maybe uh, well certainly together we don't we don't cover all the expertise that are, that is needed to solve these issues. We need to step back, and I think we need to make sure that, particularly in, a, in an intergovernmental setting, we need to move away from negotiating text brackets and commas towards. Um, Exchanging lessons on how to on how to um, how to solve these challenges, and one framework that I would like to just put for your consideration that we found very useful is the concept of pathways. And allow me just to say a couple of words about this: is when we convened in 2013, so just two years before the Paris conference, the leading energy and climate research institutions from the G20 countries on the question of what analyses they had in order to have a conversation in their own country about what a two degrees Celsius consistent energy system might look like. It was quite stunning to see that only three out of the, the G20 countries had any analysis, and some of it was not good, but they were the ones that at least had something to be, that would allow a conversation around what two degrees Celsius looked like. The others had nothing. Absolutely nothing. It was just been pure politics, and this includes the United States. There was no secret study in the Department of Energy. There was no secret study in the trusted think tank. Yes, there were some NGO pieces out there, WWF and others, Greenpeace, but they were seen as advocacy, as lobbying pieces, not as serious analysis. Uh, rightly or wrongly, but that was just a perception. And so we then set out to, and we said, well, this is crazy. This, uh, this can't be. So we set, out this, we set out to do this work that became the Deep Decarbonization Pathways Project. And we then at one point, and then we worked with China, with all these countries, every country developed a pathway. We, 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 we then learned that this is very hard, but it is doable. And then in, um, in the fall of 2014, we get a call from the White House saying, announcing that they were just about to make a presidential announcement with Xi Jinping and President Obama based on the work that we'd done, because for the first time they'd seen the feasibility of this. And that's when China made the commitment to peak its emission before 2030, and the US made its commitment to go down to minus 27 percent. So just, just as one illustration of how knowledge can shape, really can shape history. Now, what does this mean for the legal community? Um, we did, our team in the US did what I think is the most detailed and best work on this, and uh, extremely detailed, bottom-up, and the first iteration was really hardcore energy engineering. How do you manage the intermittency? How much renewable? Do you need nuclear power? All these questions, these are not value questions. I mean, there are values, of course, in all of them, but ultimately, the first order has to be technical feasibility. They came up with a pathway, and then and then they, they had a conversation with some, some leading legal minds who said, well, what you're, what you're doing is really interesting, but it raises really major, major questions from a legal perspective. 
because, for example, land use planning regulations and laws in the US are too slow, too onerous for you to be able to, to, um, to, to launch and implement a number of projects that you need in order to build the new infrastructure. And so a few lawyers got together to really to take this challenge of say, well, we need to build X thousand kilometers of high voltage distribution lines. We need to build X amount of renewable energy in roughly the following locations. And then said, well, what does this mean for the legal profession? What does this mean for legal framework? What changes do we need to make? And if, they, they, if they've issued a report on that, which we call the legal pathway towards deep decarbonization. And that is a brilliant example, I think, of, of what we need to do. Because we need all these, obviously there are major legal dimensions in this, but we need to find ways in which we, which we can connect the, the legal work to the practical challenges that in this particular case, deep decarbonization offers. That is a very complex organizational challenge. It's something that governments cannot do. Uh, they're just not able to organize these kinds of discussions. And that's something that needs to happen at universities. Um, it's the only location where this can happen. Um, and that's something that we are hoping to support. We won't do the work ourselves. We can't, we're too small for that. But we would like to help organize universities around these very practical challenges. Thank, thanks, Guido, uh, for this. I will um, give the floor to uh, Professor Pavoni in case he wants to follow up on some of these questions or ask someone new. Otherwise, I, I'll, I have some myself. Well, I, I just uh, I would just like to have Guido make uh, a couple of remarks about the high-level political forum. Where are, where are we with respect to the process, which is, uh, according to me, is one of the central points of the of the whole agenda uh, for sustainable development uh, leading to 2030. What, what what is your impression about the work of the high level political forum so far? Well, I think it's it's been a it's been a good starting point to so the high level political forum. For those who don't know, it is a is an annual meeting typically in July, operating typically under ECOSOC and the Economic and Social Council, but then once every a few years under the General Assembly to review progress in implementing the Sustainable Development Goals. And because the Sustainable Development Goals are not legally binding, there is no legal obligation on countries to report or to undertake certain measures. So everything is voluntary. And that is an advantage, but it's also, of course, a weakness um, in this. So what the High Level Political Forum does, typically it organizes thematic debates around implementation issues. And then it also invites countries to submit what's called voluntary national reviews, VNR in the jargon. Um, and these voluntary national reviews describe what countries are doing. And the first crop of these, of these, of these reviews, understandably, has focused very much on process. Um, so how are the SDGs anchored in the government? Um, what are the initiatives that the current that the government is, is undertaking in order to socialize the SDGs and to, and to, and to achieve buy-in? Um, but now, of course, we need to get into, into the nitty gritties of implementation. What would the government do? What would the budget say? What are the investments that are being made? What policy changes are needed and so forth? Um, and that's where the system right now, it, it hasn't yet delivered on that. And, and there's, there's a big question of how one can, one can shift the high level, high level political forum to grapple with these very real implementation um, challenges. Of course, one, one, one unwritten rule at the UN is that you cannot criticize governments. Governments do not go to the UN to be criticized. Um, it's a, this, is, this is the forum for, 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 for diplomacy, and so governments typically will not go there, at least, on, at least not in, a, in an intergovernmental context, to describe the problems they've encountered. And so that's where I think work like the one that we're doing under the same development goals in, and uh, sorry, under, under the SDSN, the, the same Development Solutions Network, is important and plays a complementary role. So we, we put out an annual report, Dario has already, has already referred to it, the SDG index and dashboard, that describes where countries stand using the best data that we can find. Not always official data, not always data validated by the national statistical offices, but data that we believe is, is rigorous, has been published, um, and has gone through the process of peer review. Um, and that data shows um, where countries are falling short. And I think it's that, it's, that it's, it's that balance between the official and the unofficial process that I think is really important to get right. And we hope and we need, we need the High Level Political Forum now to really shift its attention towards the practical question of implementation. 
Thanks, Guido. Um, I, I just wanted to follow up now then on, on, the, on, the, on the index and dashboard because I think there are two, two interesting um, topics that we can um, sort of draw from that one. Um, the first one is, is really the challenge of monitoring. The, in, in, in December, the um, European Union, in particular Eurostat, the statistical office, has um, published the first edition of its monitoring, of SDG, SDG monitoring uh, reports uh, in the European Union. Uh, right. The interesting thing is that they have, um, of course, they had to adopt a different methodology in the sense that um, they didn't take all the indicators that were included in the, uh, in for example, in the, in the SDG official monitoring framework, um, and they they did monitor um, not necessarily progress on uh, the targets, but like, but rather the direction and the speed of change. Um, because they they felt that for many indicators there is no EU level policy target um, in, in the sense. For one example is the uh, is the is goal twelve on responsible consumption and production, which the EU which the report uh, sees as as a, as, an, as a goal which has seen significant progress. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, it is recognized that uh, we are we're very far away from. Uh, from achieving it, and, and uh, the, the circular economy package uh, drafted by the Commission recently and pushed forward by the Commission recently makes it very clear. So what is your opinion on the difficulties of uh, harmonizing the, the monitoring frameworks really, and especially in a context like the EU where there is a very already a very established ingrained way of monitoring uh, progress of, of having already policy targets? How do we, how do we change that? Well, I think I think the I think the Eurostat monitoring report is is actually very good. I've been very critical of some other efforts. Um, it is very good, but it's also heavily constrained, um, and that's not a fault of Eurostat. It's just it's just the fact of of life. And let me just explain that. One is that you've already said that uh, the Eurostat report doesn't really measure quantitative distance to target. It doesn't say a country is 60%, 80% towards meeting the target, and it doesn't put out quantitative numbers to aim for. And the reason is that those haven't been agreed by member states. And it's not for Eurostat to, as an official agent, a data agency, to set these targets. That's a problem. Um, the reason why they haven't been set is because governments don't want to be held accountable uh, internationally. And that's understandable. None of us want to. None of us want targets. We don't want to be held accountable by our professors. Uh, we don't want to be held accountable by our flatmates to do the dishes. That's normal. Um, but somebody needs to do that. If we are to if we are to seize the potential of the goals, we need to define what goal achievement will do. And my conclusion is that Eurostat is unable to do that, you know, politically unable to do that. And so that's something that we we will take on. Um, and these and, and defining goal achievement is is complex. It requires expert judgment. It's not a black and white thing. Um, so that's something that we do. The second way in which Eurostat is constrained is that, again, for good reasons, they're the official data agency of the, of the European Union. They have established clear standards for what constitutes good and sound data. And the problem is that those are quite strict. Um, for It's a problem for some of the new, more innovative and, um, and less, less studied aspects of the same development goals agenda. And so Eurostat has not been able to include, for example, certain new, even official environment data coming from the European Environment Agency because that data hasn't yet gone through a sufficiently long period of statistical validation. And that's a very fair point. It's a very fair point. But if we look only at the official data, we will see that important issues are not addressed. And let me just give you a couple of examples. I think on a sustainable consumption and production, that's a good example because the, the, the data that we have, the metrics there are, are quite poor um, and they are very partial. Another good example, is um, are the are the spillover effects? Now, we in Europe, we have outsourced a lot of the greenhouse gas emissions to, for example, China, because the steel that used to be made in, in in Italy, France, or Germany, or the United Kingdom, some of that is now being made in India or in China, and with it, the greenhouse gas emissions have gone. That doesn't mean really that we have reduced our greenhouse gas emissions or, or our greenhouse gas footprint. We've just simply outsourced it. And those spillovers need to be understood. 
Um, just like um, the palm oil that's, that's killing the orangutan in, in Indonesia is not consumed by the Indonesian, it's consumed in the United States and China and in Europe. So these spillover effects are very, very important, but they're not measured by Eurostat. Eurostat doesn't have a mandate to do this. And so this is just a long way of saying that we do need the official um, reports like Eurostat. Many other countries can learn from them. I think Eurostat can do better in the following ways, even with, I think it can do better in terms of presenting the data to make it more political, re politically relevant. And I would think time series data is important for that. We're working on that. Second, I think one can say, one needs to say a lot more about the social inclusion topic, the leave no one behind agenda. There is more and better data available there um, because we have by global standards, low levels of poverty, but it's entrenched. And we're having a significant share of the European population that's excluded from, from the economic life. Those are issues for which we have data. I think Eurostat can do better in terms of in integrating them. But then very soon you're getting to a limit as to what Eurostat can do. And that's where I think we also need a companion unofficial report that can take, that can be more provocative and that can take a view on some of these very difficult issues. It has to be transparent, it has to be consulted, it has to be documented so that anyone can challenge it. Um, and that's what, we, that, that's, what, that, that's what we're planning to do. So we're planning to put out a report for the European Union. We're working on that. Uh, think of it as a shadow report. And this is not just to be, this is not, 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 not just to be um, difficult advocates who always criticize anything the government does, but it's really just to put additional data into the discussion. Um, so that's, and I think, I think that's the way, that's the way we, we need to work. And that's, that's also where universities play a central role. In fact, I would say universities are responsible for also working on these issues and putting such analyses and such data out. And I'm seeing, it's, it's fantastic to see so many universities rising up to the challenge, but there's many more that, yet, that, that, that have yet to do this. And so I think um, it's really important to teach the sustainable development goals um, in the classroom and universities and to, and to encourage young researchers to, to think about some of the more complex, messy challenges that arise out of implementing the sustainable development goals. Obviously, without, of course, uh, this is not to, to jettison um, academic techniques that have, been, that have been honed and established over centuries, but I think we need to stretch them. We need to stretch them so that we can work more on some of these complicated, complex societal challenges. Thanks, thanks, Guido. Uh, is there any um, question from Professor Paoni? Do you want to take some points up? I lost the connection for a couple of minutes, so I'm not sure whether Guido perhaps has already touched upon uh, uh, issues of decision-making processes at the European level. Oh, no. so good. I would like to have your view on, on that, because you're also involved with the European institutions. Do you think that, I mean, what, what is your opinion about European Union decision-making processes and, and governance in general. So do you think that, ne that it needs to be improved, be more transparent or, or something like that? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the European Union by design is a very complex beast. You know, with 27 member states, 28, um, decision-making becomes very complex. Um, we all know this, it's a quasi-intergovernmental Body. I mean, it's a unique form, as you, as you, I'm sure, are teaching your students. But it's so. So we want. We should never expect a naively simple way of decision making. And a lot has been said about the transparency, the role of the parliament. I'm not going to comment on that. I think let me let me focus on another thing, which is the the integration of different policy objectives. If we're looking at the common agricultural policy, it's just one example. That's a, a very complex set of issues that has been, that's been designed with a na fairly narrow set of objectives in mind. You know? and, and those objectives do not include health because we're not producing the healthy food. They do not include some of the environmental imperatives and others. Um, and, and I think that's what the European Union needs to learn and needs to become better at framing, at, at dealing with cross-sectoral issues um, that, that cover many different um, DGs in the Euro and so, so, so director generals um, in, in the European Commission, because we cannot look at agriculture solely 
as an agricultural production system. We need to look at what, what humans need from a healthy perspective. We need to look at it from a climate change perspective, perspective because we need to bring these emissions down. We need to look at it obviously from a, from a water perspective and a biodiversity perspective. And yes, there are many consultations, but we're still not very good at that. Um, the second challenge is regional versus national. Take energy as an example. Um, the European Union doesn't really have a union-wide energy strategy. And by that I mean is, um, you know, Greece has got lots of sun um, and Germany doesn't. So it would be natural for Greece to produce some of the solar power that Germany needs. But there is no real framework in the European Union to discuss this. It's all done at a national level and as a result, the, the resulting outcomes are highly inefficient and, and you know, and, and many member states um, take very, uni very, very unilateral decisions. I think Germany, the, the way Germany handled the energy vendors energy transition, has been has been defined solely by domestic uh, concerns and has failed to to to, to adopt a more um, European Commission wide approach. The way to deal with this, in my mind, is to is to really think about using what we have laid out and described as these integrated pathways. Um, you know, the, the two sets of challenges I've just laid out, um, each require its own integrated pathway. There needs to be a pathway forward towards decarbonizing the energy system. That needs to mobilize the engineers. It needs to look at, it needs to take national, but also European wide view. Where should the, where should the renewable power be, be, uh, be generated? Clearly we do need a large-scale distribution network. China has already built it. You know, we Europeans are sitting on our hands, even though we have, we used to until recently have more advanced technologies, but it's because our decision-making process fails on this on this particular perspective. And it needs to bring in the other disciplines as well. We do need the lawyers to advise us on what needs to change at European Commission level, um, at national levels, um, what are the other frameworks that need to be adapted in order, in order to do this transformation. And the other set of pathways that we need um, in this space are towards sustainable land use and food systems. But look at agriculture, biodiversity, terrestrial biodiversity, uh, nutrient flows associated greenhouse gas emissions, and critically, the diet, the dietary and health impacts, so that we can reduce obesity um, and at the same time reduce the environmental footprint of, um, um, of, of agricultural production. And finally, we also need to include um, the, the the expected impact from climate change because climate change is a reality it's happening the countries that are going to be most severely affected by this is the mediterranean basin so italy is going to be very seriously affected by it. greece we're already seeing turkey so there's particularly the northeast of the mediterranean we're going to see massive massive dislocations um and we need to in, 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 we need to integrate it into our policy making. I think that's my that's my big concern about European Union decision making. And just finally, the way to address this is not to say the European Union should 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 develop these pathways as a first initiative because that's impossible. It's too complicated. Um, and there is a reason why directory generals, just like every ministry, they fight for influence, they fight for budgets with one another, and that, that's good because we want a cacophony of voices. These pathways need to be put out by the knowledge community, as a first of all. They need to be put out by universities, leading research centers, cross-disciplinary teams, and once they're ready, they can then be taken up by the policy process. And that's the, that's the, um, that's the assignment for all of us to work on. Thanks, Guido. I would like to uh, briefly follow up on this uh, with a question from the audience before we move on. Um, it's it's not necessarily a uh, legal question, but it has policy implications. Uh, it comes from Robert. Um, basically, he wanted to know a bit more about how um, the scientific uh, objectives uh, that we um, that are considered, in, uh, for example, by SDSN in the creation of, of, of pathways, for either for decarbonization, sustainable land use, um, how are those linked to the to specific timelines? How do we uh, know by when we are going to achieve certain changes? And also, if I get this right, how are these then 
how could these be reasonably incorporated in the policy process? What are the difficulties there in, in, in those timelines being um, incorporated in, in policy and law with, with, uh, with sufficient ambition? Right. Well, that's a, that's a, really, it's a really great question. Um, and not an easy one to answer. Um, there is an increasing focus among scientists on what we call science-based targets. So two degrees Celsius is a science-based target. But I think we also need to recognize, and obviously, and we do know that, we know now that two degrees Celsius, in fact, two degrees Celsius is going to become a very unpleasant world. That's not, that's not a safety. Um, most scientists now think that it's, it's too lenient, too, too lax. So we should really be aiming for 1.5 or even one degree Celsius. And just for all of us to know, we already have passed one degree Celsius, we're, but we're, we're, we're at about 1.1 right now. Um, but should it be two degrees or 1.9 degrees, 2.1 uh, degrees, that ultimately becomes a bit of an arbitrary thing. So I think we also need to be clear that these are also, ultimately these objectives have to be social. Science can inform them, but there isn't a, there isn't a, a, a right number. You know, it's not 2.0127, that's the target. It doesn't exist. And so, so that's something that we need, ultimately we need to start to dialogue. We need, we need more science on this. Um, we also need to recognize that it's illusory for a bunch of scientists to define targets for countries around the world. I mean, much of the science is being done in Europe, and of course it's not for, for, Europe, for, for a group of European scientists to tell Brazil what it should aim for, what, what Brazil's targets are. So there's, even there, there is a process of, of negotiation, um, of education that needs to happen. This is complex. This is, this is, this is hard and very soft social sciences as well. Um, and that's something that we are that we are we're deeply involved in right now. Uh, we've got a global network to to tackle precisely these questions, and we're thinking day to day really very much about process. But then, let me just let me just sort of illustrate how the two degrees Celsius target really came about, and how it became so influential, what it and how it then translates into policies, because that's really the core of Robert's excellent question. So two degrees Celsius was has been has been proposed by scientists now for some time just because it happens to be a round number in about the right ballpark number. It was then endorsed. It was then taken up by the inter intergovernmental panel on climate change, uh, the IPCC, which is a very interesting and a very important body where science, where governments basically sign on to scientific assessments. So there is a messy part to it, but basically it is a science-led process. And governments signed on to it, and, and, and that's where two degrees Celsius almost is some, became something that the governments had endorsed. And, and then at the Paris Climate Agreement, it was formally enshrined in the, in the outcome document of COP21, and the, the language there is to, is to aim for well below 2, 2 degrees Celsius, aiming towards 1.5. Um, and once you've set that, two degrees Celsius, science gives us a fairly clear so-called carbon budget. So two degrees Celsius, of course, describes the average increase in, in the average temperatures. And we all know that the temperature increase is principally led by increases in so-called greenhouse gases. So carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, others. And you can compare them, so you can translate them into common currency, if you like. And we know we now have through models a reasonably good, a good understanding of how many tons of carbon in the atmosphere two degrees Celsius corresponds. So we know how much has been emitted. And so we know how much quote unquote carbon budget there still is. So how many tons or how many gigatons, how many billion tons of carbon can still be emitted through to 2050 or to the end of the century. And then once you do that, that's where these pathways kick in that, I, that I've just described. Then you do analyses and say, well, you know, how can we ensure if productive economies, we want economic growth, we want people to, 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 to live well, we don't want dramatic changes in living, in, in, in living standards, that, that, will not, that will not be possible. But we need those to be consistent with the, um, with the carbon budget. So that's where these decarbonization pathways come in. <coughs> and, and they then lead to a number of really interesting findings. So, all the pathways that are consistent with two degrees Celsius show that by 2030, you know, give or take a couple of years, we really need to have decarbonized um, uh, passenger transport. So vehicles have to be zero carbon. 
So by 2030, we can no longer register new vehicles that emit greenhouse gas emissions. In the jargon, have to be zero tailpipe emission vehicles. That nobody knows whether these should be battery-driven vehicles that are that are powered with clean uh, with clean energy that is uh, generated through renewable power, for example, or whether this should be hydrogen vehicles where the hydrogen is then generated through electricity that comes from renewable energy or other clean power. Um, there are many different technological options, but what we can then say is we can lay out benchmarks to say by 2030, vehicles have to be zero carbon. And that's very useful. That's very useful for businesses because if all the automotive companies say, look, we don't care what technology you pick, that's for you to decide. But the marching order is that by 2030, you can no longer have any vehicles that emit greenhouse gas emissions. That's something that they can then say, okay, great. Well, let's get our engineers working on this. And so those are that's my that's my my vision of how this might work is that we need to develop we need to do we need to set long term targets, translate them into pathways. See what does this mean, and then from that will come out what we call technology benchmarks regarding um, regarding emissions from green from 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 from, from passenger cars from buses from lorries regarding emissions um, from from buildings energy efficiency standards power generation standards and you name it um, and that's what we then need to and this this then gives you if you like individual wedges or solution innovation challenges that we then can get the respective communities to work uh, on that's how you get that's that's basically what a science-based a goal-based process i believe would look like that takes a systemic view because the energy system is an integrated system you can't just only look at individual piece, uh, bits and pieces of it you need to you need to have you need to you need to put the whole together um, but then divides it up into into specific challenges that expert communities like the engineers developing the next generation of cars or the people working on building energy efficiency can work on thanks thanks, thanks. Um, uh, another, another question, question we have, have uh, uh, from the audience um, in your view, should the European Union adopt another sustainable development strategy? You, we, we know that the European Union uh, has a fairly old sustainable development strategy by now, but then there were, um, there were a lot of emphasis uh, from the Commission on the uh, new European consensus on development on, on the one hand and on the uh, key European actions for, for sustainability, so the way in which the EU is supposed to implement the, the 2030 agenda in the EU. Is that enough? Does it need a new overarching strategy? Do we need to move into uh, more, let's say, the, the practical implementation phase? Well, I think we clearly need to move into the implementation phase now because um, that's the beauty of the same development goals. We have the goals. We have the objectives. You know, Paris Climate Agreement is very clear what the European Union needs to needs to achieve, we need to we need to be a zero net emitter of greenhouse gas emissions by around 2050 to 2070. That's a clear goal. And so now the question really is, and that's the only question that I'm interested in, is how can this goal be achieved? And um, what this requires ultimately is a plan. And let me just explain this a little bit. Um, these are very complex challenges that clearly require action from business for sure. But the market cannot solve this problem alone, the market alone. Uh, whether or not a country invests in nuclear power or, or only renewables is not just a market decision because you've got very complex social issues of acceptability of various technologies. Every siting of a new power plant is a social decision because you need to pick a location, you need to have zoning laws, you need to build the surrounding infrastructure. You need to compensate people who, who live there, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These are, not, these are not market decisions, by and large. And so we just need to, we need to recognize that. And for, for that, we need, we need a plan. And that's a very unpopular term these days. Uh, and it also mustn't be confused with um, Soviet-style central plan, centrally planned economy. This is not about planning uh, which products go into the supermarket shop. By well, my God, not. But it's a plan for how, for example, to stick to this example, we can decarbonize Europe's energy system. And this has to have a regional dimension, which, as I've said earlier, is lacking right now. It has to have a national dimension. It has to have 
um, a dimension of uh, public investments in, in R&D and research and development. It has to have a dimension of uh, policy incentives, framing rights, but also of outright um, policy um, of, 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 sorry, of, of outright public investments. And so that's what I'm interested in. Is, and it has to be long term. It has to have a 40, 50 year time frame. And that seems crazy. Uh, because of course the European budget is what is it? Is it? It's a it's a it's a five to ten. What, what's the cycle of the of the European budget these days? Uh, the the next one is from two thousand twenty to two thousand twenty six. If I'm not mistaken. Yeah, so it's a six. That's what I thought. It's a six year cycle. Thank you. Um, that's already seen very long because most governments will operate only on an annual cycle. And now here I am saying we need to take a forty fifty year view. Why am I saying that? because every power plant you build today is going to be active for at least 40, 50, 60, 70 years. And if we are, if we are to get to zero by 2050, 2070, well, we need to take this into account now when we're building new power plants, because either we have to build power plants that are already zero emissions, or we need to accept the fact that the power plants today will not live out their economic lifetime. They have to be shut off before. Um, and, and that's a really important point. Um, that you can, we can go deeper into, but suffice to say that if you're just looking at climate change, climate policy, on this rolling six-year cycle, you can show both theoretically and practically that you will then actually go in the wrong directions. You know, even the best intentions. If you're asking the question of how should we max, how should we max, how can we maximize in a cost-effective way the reduction of greenhouse gas over the next six years, you will end up doing things that will harm your ability to meet a longer term objective. And just to give you an example, you know, I've praised the US, the United States earlier, this of course under the previous President Obama, um, for adopting a strategy to reduce its emissions by 27%. And if you take 27% and if you extrapolate that into the future, it's about right. You know, if we if you keep the same percentage reduction year on year, you get to zero by 2050. But if you then lift the hood and see what is it that's in the strategy, the, the two major planks of the strategy are shifting from coal-based power generation to natural gas, and the other one is to increase the efficiency of the internal combustion engine. Those are both great ways, low-hanging fruits, to get your to get your your emission reductions. But then you're stuck, because then instead of a coal-based power system, you've got a natural gas-based power system, and natural gas still emits greenhouse gases, but we have to get to zero. So, so this is an example where. And, and it's really it's really the policy instrument that was wrong. The policy instrument, a six-year budget is even intellectually, analytically incoherent with the notion of a carbon budget. It's impossible to stay within a carbon budget if your policy instrument is a six-year running budget. That's why we need the long-term pathways. That's why we need a long-term pathway that then says, okay, here is how we get to zero by 2070 or 2050. And this is what it means for the first six years of, of the first six years of a 40-year pathway. That's why we need the plans. The plans need to be discussed and they need to be debated with industry. They need to be flexible. This is, this is, this is highly iterative um, dynamic optimization. And of course, you know, we shouldn't be under the illusion. Nobody, nobody's got a perfect crystal ball. We cannot predict the future, certainly not over 40 years. That's illusory. But we need to take decisions now. We need to take decisions on infrastructure now. We need to make sure that those decisions are based on our best understanding today of how we get to zero emissions. And that right now is not happening in the European Union. And so that's where we need, that's why I don't want a new strategy if the strategy is a 2030 strategy. I don't want a new strategy if the strategy asks the question, what should we be aiming for? What I want is a strategy that describes here is here are the next six years of what it means in terms of the budget that is integrated in a long-term pathway to, to, to achieve the objectives of the Paris Climate Agreement. That raises very, very complex questions of governance, policy making, coordination, and the truth is we don't have answers to them, good answers yet. I mean, and certainly we have no experience in dealing with them, and we can't point to another country that is doing this perfectly. I mean, I can give you some examples where I think this is being done better. California would be at the top of my list for this, not the United States, but California as a state. But that's, but, but this sort of, you know, this, this, this state of affairs where we're, we're facing big knowledge gaps is actually, it's, first, it's not surprising, and second, it's actually quite exciting. It is exciting for all of us because we're in the knowledge business, so we want to solve new problems. And 
this is a big one and uh, there is no historical precedent for this so if you want to develop your career to if you want to devote your career to that i can't think of a better topic um but it's also not surprising because this is the first time humanity has ever faced this problem you know economic development in the past and societal development has been unguided technology development has been there was no plan to say we need these technologies in the future and the reason simply is because we never needed one but now we need to live within a carbon budget there is a the the the, the homework our exam question is how can europe be prosperous and get to zero emissions by 2070 and humanity has never faced a question like this one and as a result humanity has never developed governance tools to do this and no country has and that's that i think is the really fascinating but also really deep and tough sets of questions that we need to address and to make it even more complicated as i've already i've already scolded the european union for for really not acting adequately at the at a, at a, at a, at a, at a community level at a, at a at a european union level on energy for example because you connect the national and the regional well the problem is even more complex than that because the european union also needs to form its strategy with a view to its role as part of the world because the assignment the homework assignment is of course for the planet you know the planet needs to get to net zero emissions and the european union is part of that how do you articulate that we've got some ideas on how to do this but this has never been done and this is certainly something that our current institutions are not designed for so that's um that's another really exciting research agenda so i'm, I'm giving you lots of lots of great phd topics here so you can have armies of students work on them uh, but we need to do that fast because we need to we need we need the answers not in 2050 we need them soon um and um that's basically why we have decided to focus on knowledge because we think that's the biggest binding constraint right now i'm less worried about the politics i'm less worried about political will we need to we need to provide policymakers with the knowledge and the understanding of how the problem can be solved right now they don't have that and if you're a policymaker if we're policymakers and there's a big hairy complex problem and we've got no idea how to solve it well we're going to focus on something else because we need to get reelected and you don't do that by talking about problems you do that by celebrating solutions and 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 achievements thanks so thanks Thanks, yeah. just, um, jumping, jumping in here, because um, you mentioned uh, something which uh, we, we have five minutes left, so I'll, I'll just jump in here. Yeah. Um, you mentioned something that relates both to a question that is another question that was asked and to another topic that we wanted to briefly touch upon before the end of the webinar, which is the topic of uh, the EU budget and how the EU uh, budget and the EU actions can contribute to sustainable development in third countries right. and in the rest of the world. Um, the question that we had from Solange was specifically about uh, official development assistance, uh, but I would like to take a broader view uh, of the whole thing, which, which we wanted to jump in. Do you see the current uh, work of the EU towards developing a uh, sustainable finance strategy? Um, there was, uh, you know, a report from a high-level commission uh, very recently published. Do you see uh, the EU as as moving uh, forward strongly in terms of seeing this this role as as a leader for the rest of the world, especially given how some of these problems are affecting uh, the EU in in an increasing way? Uh, look at migration. No further than that. Well, I think I think the European Union is doing lots of good things, but it's still without without a clear understanding of how the problem can be solved. We're focusing on marginal changes, and every community is is racing, and that's good. But there is no shared understanding, and again, I'm repeating myself, but there is no pathway to stick to this to stick to the energy problem. There's no pathway for for getting towards a zero emission European Union a pathway that has been adopted, and so therefore. The finance community is defining, you know, is defining its own questions, what it, would, what it wants to work on, and it's celebrating success on green finance, often quite small scale, but without a clear understanding of what is what is it the finance community needs to deliver to solve the problem. And when you go to investor conferences of infrastructure financiers, they've by now all heard about climate change. Are they integrating this into their project financing? Absolutely not. And so we still have that we still have that that coherence issue unless we solve that and this is this is the basic this is my basic point is 
if you look at energy, energy is a complex system. You can't just you can't just tinker with one part of the energy grid without understanding the other pieces. And that's a good metaphor for decarbonization as a whole. You do need to have an understanding. You do need to have a top-down macro understanding of what the system will look like. And of course, it's going to be flexible. It'll change. New technologies will learn new things. And then you can get the lawyers to work on on the land uh, permit regulation processes. You can get the financiers to work on the debt and the equity. You can get the trade unions to think about how do we retrain our workers so that we don't have a bunch of, of miners holding up the end of the whole the whole project. But everyone needs, everyone needs to work on their pieces, but it needs to be based on a common understanding right now. And I just don't see that in the case of, of green finance. And every time I go to these conferences, I present them with our estimates of what the overall financing needs are, what, what might be public and private. And I say, well, these are our targets you know, to the best of our ability. This is what your sector, this is what your community needs to, de needs to develop. And the, and the reaction is always quite telling us. First, they've never thought about it that way. So what they're thinking about is what are new creative ways to, for example, blend and leverage financing, and that's all very good. But is it linked to actually solving the problem? It doesn't operate at the right scale. And that's the second lesson is quite often they really are um, stunned by the scale of the challenge. And it then turns out that some of the tools, solutions they're working on are just too small scale and will never ever reach the right scale that's needed. Um, and that's that's a good lesson to learn early on. So maybe we should be thinking about other things. Thank, thanks, Guido. Uh, so we are approaching the end. So I would give maybe the floor to Professor Pavoni in case you want to follow up on some of these questions uh, and some of the topics touched, uh, or if he has some concluding thoughts. Oh, no. First of all, I would like to thank uh, our guest uh, for being with us. And um, as I said, we are, we are profoundly grateful to him. Uh, there would be many follow-ups to his uh, very always engaging and very interesting remarks. Uh, and one point was about if you, if you can give us your impression just uh, in, in a few words about uh, uh, this uh, diesel cars uh, uh, great news. Uh, when I heard that uh, the German Federal Tribunal has uh, empowered all German mayors to ban traffic to diesel cars, uh, and on the other hand, I can see that Fiat has announced that it will uh, stop production, producing diesel cars by 2020. And I see this as a precious example of alliance between the private and public sector, which you were mentioning before. I don't know if you have any thoughts on this. Yes or no. I mean, as a, as a European and as a German, I'm actually deeply worried about it. Okay. Because the situation that we have right now is that German automotive companies no longer meet the environmental standards in China. All right. Because China is saying, not only do you need to lower your average fleet emissions, they're also saying a certain number of your vehicles need to be zero emissions. What are European uh, automotive manufacturers focusing on? They're focusing on making diesel more efficient. All right. We all know, if we take, again, if we take climate change seriously, there is no long-term future for diesel. In fact, in 2030, there must not be any new diesel vehicles put on the road. So should we be spending our scarce R&D dollars on diesel? No, we shouldn't. It's stupid. What I find very worrying is at the same time, Bosch, you know, the, one of the largest automotive supplier companies, announced yesterday that they stopped R&D on, on, on batteries. It's now becoming a technology which is entirely owned by Asian companies, Chinese companies. Is that a good way to do industrial policy in Europe? No, oh, it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. And the fact that we're even debating the, the future of diesel as a question, that's not even that's even putting aside all the health all the health um, costs. I mean the health costs are massive. Um, you know, the NOx uh, solution, nitrous oxide solution from diesel cars and particulate emissions is massive. And the fact that we have to deal with this in European cities is an anach is an is anachronism, is an example of bad policy making. And so I find this actually, this is the cannery in the coal mine of whether or not Europe is fit, to the fit for the future. And the signs right now are not looking good. Thanks, thanks, Guido. Uh, okay, then I, we, we, we just passed the, the, the one hour mark. So I, I would uh, like to thank uh, Dr. Guido Smitrop for, for being with us. We don't want to keep him further. Um, 
And we are uh, very grateful also for, um, to, to everyone who attended and for your questions. Uh, the EU Law and Sustainable Development webinar series will continue. We will announce the following dates um, soon, hopefully. And uh, we thank Guido again for the, for the brilliant, brilliant points uh, on, on uh, the SDG implementation in the EU, which uh, provides a, uh, a very uh, interesting food for thought, which will inform also the next talks and the next activities of, of the project. Um, I'm not sure if there is any other comment that uh, both of you want to, want to add, but otherwise I, I'll, I'll uh, say thanks again and wrap it up. Great. Well, thank you very much. It was a great pleasure and look forward to being in touch. Thank, thanks, Guido. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thanks, Professor.